I like to think of two great frontiers of knowledge. One is understanding the universe itself. And that journey has been expressed nowadays in terms of astrophysics, you know, understanding what were the beginnings of the, the, the universe. And that is sort of looking out into the world. But there's an equally important, and I would say more fundamental journey, which is looking inwards to understanding how is it this organ which enables us to recognize fundamental laws of physics and chemistry, how is that performing these incredible operations. So where are we at in our understanding of the brain? I would say we have a very sophisticated understanding of the brain, but we're only at the very beginning of the journey. I like to think we're at the foothills of the Himalayas. We need to get to the top of those mountains, and that's going to be a long journey. And what we're lacking at the moment is a very fundamental knowledge of the relationship between brain function, the activity of cells or ensembles of cells, and what they encode in terms of what is the mathematical principle that underpins their function, that enables us to think, to remember, and to emote. We have very sophisticated maps of the brain whereby we can map functions like vision, audition, taste, onto very discrete locations. A question one might ask is whether we can have such a map for things like emotions, whether we can map fear, joy, anger, disgust. Well, there's a very good evidence that an emotion like fear involves a structure like the amygdala. An emotion like happiness or joy seems to involve another structure called the basal ganglia or the ventral striatum. So emotions can be distinguished in the brain. Emotions are ways of signaling whether we're in a good context or a bad context. They're a sophisticated signaling system for value. So that if I'm fearful, that's telling me that I'm in a bad situation and I need to act upon it. So these are conserved systems that have been sculpted by evolution, endow us with rapid ways of dealing with very complicated situations. I'm interested in how people make decisions, and by that I mean what is the information they take into account in choosing A rather than B, what is it that influences them when they make bad decisions? And how has decision making gone awry or gone wrong in neurological and psychiatric disorders? To study decision making and to make it realistic, we have to design very specific tasks. And those tasks will usually involve people having to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty. So that's the psychological problem. We're interested in the neurobiological implementation of this. So what is happening in the brain? And to get at that question, we use technologies like functional magnetic resonance imaging. So this is an adaptation of MRI technology, which many people will have experienced because they've had scans on their back, their shoulders, or maybe even their heads. But it's a special application which enables us to measure activity in the living human brain in close to real time. I started on my research career as a psychiatrist. I pursued neuroscience for 25 years, but part of my sort of journey of personal fulfillment is to go back into psychiatry and take the knowledge that I've gained from neuroscience and apply it to understanding what is the most common source of human misery and unhappiness, namely psychiatric disorders in all their manifestations. It's unlikely I would have come here with the frequency that I've come here without the uh, funding from the Einstein Foundation. The funding has been very important in a number of ways. Firstly, it has provided me the opportunity to collaborate, to create things that would not have happened had I not come here. 
The most graphic example of that is the impending opening of a Max Planck Centre straddling Berlin and London. It has also provided me opportunities to train and hopefully inspire young people who will, I hope, go on to develop independent careers as independent thinkers of their own. Berlin has a very fine history in science. A hundred years ago, you could argue that Berlin was unsurpassed as the center for the very best science. You had the best mathematicians, the best physicists, the best chemists here. That tradition was lost. I think to regain that tradition is going to require significant investment. But there is such a wonderful history here that I think it is possible to regain this. And part of this will come through creating a vibrant environment that encourages visitors like me to come here, that creates again a culture that brings out the very, very best in the young scientists who will be the leaders of the future here. And I hope that my time here has contributed in some small way to this endeavor.